Well, my next guest tonight says that pharmaceutical companies view COVID-19 as a once-in-a-lifetime business opportunity. In his book, Pharma, Greed, Lies, and the Poisoning of America, Gerald Posner details how an entire industry betrayed the people it was entrusted to protect and heal. Posner is a New York Times bestselling author and an award-winning journalist, and he joins me tonight from Miami, Florida. Gerald Posner, it's good to have you on the day. With this coronavirus pandemic that we are in right now, um, would you say that it is in the interest of the pharmaceutical companies for the crisis to get worse? Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, exactly in line with what your previous guest said, that would be a cold calculus that nobody's going to say. Uh, the people at the pharmaceutical companies, the executives, the scientists working in the labs, they would like to be able to come up with a vaccine, not just for the profit, but because it serves everybody's purpose. It's going to save this financial collapse that's taking place. It's going to save lives. And they come to the rescue. They look as though they're the superhero with the white cape on. So there's a lot of reasons why they do really want to do it, many of them very good ones. The researchers, you say, of course, they want to find a vaccine. They want to find a cure. But the system in which they're operating in the United States, um, it is... It's unique or it's different when you compare it to what it is here in Europe when it comes to medicine and profits, isn't it? No question about it. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, I talk about this uh, in, throughout the book that we, the United States, the only country in the world that allow pharmaceutical companies unfettered power to set their own prices. In Europe, you have the good common sense in Germany, the UK, France, Spain, Italy and other countries to negotiate and to have set prices with them. You don't allow every drug that's approved uh, to automatically be available for everybody. They have to show you that if they're charging an exorbitant price, it's going to cost less to the healthcare system than the long term treatment of that person. There's no such standard here. So the majority of their profits have been made in the United States for the last 70 years. They continue to do so. And what's really particularly irritating is that, for instance, the National Institutes of Health, which is the government-sponsored health agency in the U.S., has spent $900 billion since the 1930s on public research that pharmaceutical companies have then taken, patented, and had exclusive rights to with billions of dollars in profits. That brings us right into the question of vaccines for COVID-19, because a lot of the money being flooded in now is public research money. The companies looking to come up with a vaccine may be looking to put a patent on it eventually. That could be a cause of some consternation. And, and there, have to, there have to be bridges here, paths of connection between um, the, the research world and, and government. And what, what, what do you make then of the experts who are advising the U.S. president on this pandemic? Well, he has an excellent medical team around him. There's no question. I, I know some of those individuals, and I know that the group that's there in terms of the scientists, the researchers, and the doctors are a, a, a good group. The question is how much he will listen to them, and that I'm not sure. We'll have to find out as we go along. He certainly is paying attention now, and he's responding to it. But I did see the other day, for instance, in the U.S., the first thing that Congress did with the president was pass an $8.3 billion emergency funding bill. Now, everybody's focused on the end result, which is let's stop the spread of the, of the virus, and that's the right focus. Let's have self-isolation, and let's worry about getting over it, lowering the death rate. But I noticed that pharma's lobbyists were out, the drug company, and what they did in that bill is they took out two clauses. One would have made any of the research that they were involved with, if they left the program, then public research. They wouldn't have had any intellectual property rights to it. They were able to get that excluded. There was also another clause that would have given the government some real punitive damages to bring prices down in case the eventual price of a vaccine was too expensive for third world and developing countries. That also got taken out. It's going to be negotiated in the future. The problem is when it's negotiated in the future, there's more leverage for the pharmaceutical company. So it's interesting for me, since I have a microscope on pharma, yeah. to watch as the lobby sort of, you know, take out the little things in these bills with the big flood of public money to make sure they're protected down the road. I want you to take a listen to what um, Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar said on March 5th. Now, he makes predictions on March 5th for the future that is now the present. Take a listen. And, and our testing in the United States has been very has been very consistent, if not even more aggressive than similarly impacted countries. So we are not Korea. Korea is in a very active hot zone outbreak, um, as is northern Italy. And so uh, we have been ramping up our testing and actually where we will stand in the next week to week and a half in terms of availability of testing will place us far ahead, far, far ahead 
of similarly impacted major countries around the world. So um, we've actually been progressing with this on par with all of our peer countries uh, in Europe, for instance, um, similarly impacted. So, so Gerald, he says there that today the United States should be far ahead, far, far ahead of similarly impacted major countries around the world. Is the United States there? Absolutely not. Brent, I wish it were so. If those words were accurate, it would be fantastic. And it's misleading in this sense. South Korea, perfect example. They learned a lesson from 2015 when the MERS outbreak took place, a related sort of um, viral cousin to the current COVID. Uh, and when they had 38 deaths, their economy almost went into a recession. They decided afterwards they were going to do something about it. They passed regulations that allowed them to have super fast testing. When China reported the first cases of coronavirus, they took a kit from the World Health Organization, they did in South Korea, mm -hmm. and they prepared ten, uh, the ability to do 10,000 tests a day. They also passed some measures of intrusion into privacy that many of us in Western Europe and the United States would not accept. They went into the cell phone records of those who were found to be positive uh, for the virus, and they also looked at their credit card. So they put online where those people had been. They didn't put up their names, but where they had been, if they went to the cinema, where they sat, if they'd been to a restaurant. So you would know as a non-infected person whether in fact you might have a risk. As a result, they did a quarter million tests. They kept their infection rate very low, and their death rate is 0.9 compared to Italy's six. So South Korea is the model, if you look at testing, wow. put aside the privacy intrusion. And, you know, you, you mentioned vaccines. The first human trials for a coronavirus vaccine began yesterday in the United States, and the U.S. has earmarked funding to expedite research into a vaccine. Public money for public health, it, you would think, but does that guarantee that this vaccine will be free for everyone once it's ready? Uh, you know, I, I found that after five years of working on a, a book on the pharmaceutical industry, the one word that almost never comes into play is the word free. It doesn't fit into almost any aspect of it. Uh, they're always at least recovering cost. And on top of cost, they put some research and development that it would take 16 economists to try to figure out how they put that in. The thing is that we expect, you know, there's all this talk about the vaccine being ready in a year to 18 months, which would be a land speed record. I hope that that's the case. But remember that viruses are tough sometimes to figure out. We just gave, in the F we, meaning the United States, the FDA, our Food and Drug Administration, gave last year in 2019 the approval for the first time to a vaccine for Ebola. That was uh, 46 years after Ebola first appeared in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. That's how long it took to get one. We still don't have a vaccine after some 30 years for AIDS, coming on nearly 40 years for HIV and AIDS. So everybody's assuming they can immediately master the vaccine get the, the viruses uh, spread as they have to throughout, figure out that viral strain and get it right to market. That's the best case scenario. But mm -hmm. I assure you that whenever it comes, whether it's a year and a half or two years from now, the pharmaceutical company that's first in line will be looking to recoup a small profit, as they would describe it. Okay. We've got about a minute left, Gerald. I just want to ask you, you know, you've talked to lots of people in the pharmaceutical industry, but you've also seen what's happening on Capitol Hill. How do you explain um, the, the Democrats allowing... Um, this stimulus package to be passed and there not to be any type of price restrictions. I mean, where is the, where's the resistance or the public outcry here? Uh, be, I think that an election year changes the calculus a lot. And so no party, neither party, wants to be in a position when November comes near for the presidential election, when the other side could run ads that says, this is the party that at the critical moment when the country was facing a pandemic, decided yeah. to vote against this stimulus package and put your health at risk because that's how it's cast. So everybody is gritting their teeth up there on both sides of the aisle and doing what they always do in Congress and the presidency, throw a lot of money at it and hope somewhere along the line it fixes the problem. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah, we'll definitely have to wait and see. That's true. Gerald Posner joining us tonight from Miami. Gerald, we appreciate your insights. Valuable stuff tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Brent.